Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, episode 26, which is shaping up to be our final episode of season one of our of our operator series. So welcome back uh, to those of you that have joined us a bunch. Really appreciate you coming along with us for the journey. Can't believe we've been, we've been doing this for um, six months straight, yet to take a week off. Um, and so I think I think next week might be our first week off. We we will see. So first, everybody, you know the drill. Drop in the chat where you're calling in from. As always, I'm here, Orange County, Southern California. Nick is on the other side of the U.S. Um, on the Cape. Did I say it right this time, Nick? That's right. It's been uh, 26 episodes, and you finally got it right. Appreciate that, Casey. There, there we go. And all to do tough, in- tough life living on the Cape. <laughs> <laughs> hey, see Vincent. He's in. Uh, where Vincent? Uh, it's a good segue. You're in New York City, right? I'm in Soho. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Great to be here, guys. Cheers. He, he understands the Cape life, so no. So yeah. our East Coasters <laughs> over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm um, from Boston originally, so. Oh. Two Boston people, I, I gotta go. Oh, this yeah. is so perfect. This is this is why we are twenty episode twenty six. Now I now I get it. Yeah. Um, well, perfect. We got people calling in from all over again. Let's see. We'll call our international people first. We've got London, Panama, Buenos Aires, uh, then Florida. I think that's still part of the U.S. Um, we've got Chicago, L.A., San Diego, Austin. We always get some Austin. We've got Myrtle Beach. Perfect. So I'm gonna jump in, introduce Vincent over here. He's the co-founder and CEO of Proper Wild. They are a plant-based energy shot. I actually ordered the variety pack right before we jumped on. Um, I'm so look forward to that. I can mix it in with my Verb Energy bars and we'll see what kind of energy I can bring. With, with COVID it. and kids, I need, I need all of these that I can get. <laughs> um, and then before Proper Wild, and I actually wanna start the conversation here. Before Proper Wild, Vincent was the CEO and co-founder of, a, of FinTech Global Markets, which is a tech-enabled investment bank. So let's start there. Like, yeah, talk us through. That was acquired, I think, in 2017. Um, yeah. And how did that acquisition come to play? And then let's talk about your segue into the e-commerce world. Yeah. So I I started tinkering with building software when I was in college at Michigan. It was basically originally um, building marketing websites. And that led into then getting involved in the tech industry. I, my first job out of college was at a tech company called um, Find the Best, which then got renamed to Graphic and then sold to Amazon. It was a um, basically like a data structuring platform that was founded by Kevin O'Connor, who is the former founder of DoubleClick, which is now you know the whole Google AdWords network. Kevin's a billionaire, very successful. So I cut my teeth with like a, I mean, an absolute A plus, rock star unicorn ceo kevin o'connor right out of college which was a great experience and that kind of taught me how to build real product i was a product manager right out of college and kevin's kevin's whole philosophy is he hires really smart athletes um out of college pays him nothing like he, he runs like you know have a company of 30 people with like a burn of like you know 50k a month um and I mean, it's brilliant, his strategy, but but learned a lot from Kevin and the Jobs Act happened in 2012. And I um, I got really excited about the Jobs Act. I was, a, I was a part of a team at Find the Best that just came off a $6 million fundraise. And I was learning about capital um, raising and I was learning about, you know, different types of securities and and I was tinkering around with doing my own business and, you know, understanding how difficult it is to raise capital and finding investors and just all the complexities there. And then the Jobs Act happened in 2012, Obama signed, um, which was Jumpstart Our Business Startup Act. And it basically created all these new regulations around how you could raise capital for your business. And I was like, this is so cool, blah, blah, blah. And I ended up partnering with another like really successful entrepreneur, investor, um, guy named Mark Dime in Los Angeles, who multi-billionaire. He was the first investor in Skype. Um, he has a big multifamily office, and he's the chairman of three venture funds. And he had this dormant broker-dealer license, and he was the, also a co-founder of a law firm. And he was super interested in the Jobs Act. And I happened to be a young entrepreneur that understood how to build software, had an idea. Mark had all of this expertise. He had obviously access to capital. And we partnered together um, and ended up building, we, we branded ourselves as a tech-enabled investment bank. 
Um, what that what that meant is we helped startups raise capital, taking advantage of the Jobs Act. So you know, being able to publicly advertise. You you see people raising money now on Facebook and Instagram, and all these platforms selling their securities. We became kind of the piping and the underlying plumbing that helped them do that compliantly. And we realized there was a lot more opportunity. Um, instead of helping startups directly, it was helping other investment banks and other placement agents and people that raise money professionally around the country, helping them help lots of companies. So we ended up creating a white label platform. That's what FinTech Global Markets was. Um, we were a full clearing broker dealer. We raised um, close to $11 million, had a team of almost 50 people. And then we ended up getting acquired by a boutique investment bank that was really aggressive in the space and had a big team, several offices, big sales team that was able to really take what we had built and, and leverage it. So business is still doing well. My co-founder in that business ended up staying on and running it. I'm an entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur, and like I like to build things. And it very much was turning into becoming an investment banker. Like we had, the company had gone from a startup to solving a lot of problems to like, okay, now let's just help people raise a lot of money. And like, that's not what I was interested in. So I took all my securities licenses that I had, I got rid of them, <laughs> um, did a little bit of angel investing, started to get really involved in DTC, did some advising, made a couple small investments. I like to say I was like getting my MBA, you know, I, I like to say I have an MBWA um, management by walking around. <laughs> um, but yeah, I got my basically like cut my teeth in DTC and really started to understand customer acquisition and funnels and all the challenges with that around fulfillment, which I didn't have a lot of experience with before I before I jumped into proper wild. So that's you know that's my that's my quick background. But um, I've I've had the the last thing I'll say is I've had the the privilege to work with some amazing entrepreneurs, and I'm 32 and I I basically worked for two successful billionaire entrepreneurs that have literally helped create, you know, some of the most pivotal businesses of the last hundred years in our country. I mean, DoubleClick and, um, and Skype. Um, and there's a, there's a couple other ones in their resume. And that, that is like the smartest thing I did in my early twenties was work for those guys. That's awesome. And, yeah. you know, I wanted to hear about then how you moved into proper wild, but I guess the, another follow up question I had was, you know, scaling your, or, you know, as you move into D to C or direct to consumer, is how do you accelerate that those learning that learning cycle? And it sounds to me like you know you're partnering with some of like the best and the brightest probably across New York and and the world. So talk me through that, like how you're able to position your experience and maybe maybe even like your angel investing to get access to to this knowledge to then put you in a position to grow proper wild very quickly. Yeah, the, w whenever you go into a sector that you have no experience with, I think you it gives you the ability to think differently, which is super important because you're not you're not like boxed in by the traditional way of industry thinking, mm -hmm. but it also means you know absolutely fucking nothing about all of the really difficult challenges that you're about to face. You know, when I when I first got into thinking about proper wild and DTC, I had no idea of the importance of price point and weight and how that affects your margin. Um, you know, it, it, it's virtually impossible to be successful selling like a 12 ounce beverage online. It's just the weight of selling that is going to be too much, you know, just from fulfillment cost. your margins are going to get eaten into and then you look at customer acquisition. So there's a formula that you need to kind of hit from an economic standpoint on, you know, weight, fulfillment cost, customer acquisition, lifetime customer value, repurchase rate. Like the, there's a formula of what success looks like, which I had no idea when I was selling my last business, thinking about the proper wild idea in its infancy. Um, but the, the advantage I had was I had just come off of starting an investment bank, literally having no finance background. I became the CEO and co-founder of the largest tech enabled investment bank in the United States. I got my series six, my series 63. Um, I became a licensed representative. And through that experience, I realized that any business I start next, I'm going to literally know nothing about nothing. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, still a young guy, but like I had been humbled um, enormously. So instead of jumping into the next business, I think the smartest thing I did was 
I did get involved. I got involved with a credit card company, which is a consumer product and really um, dug in deep, helping them launch the product, do a pre-launch, um, had a very successful pre-launch and learned a lot about consumer customer acquisition. Um, I got involved in a couple um, DTC companies that I'm advisors with now. Most of them are small, um, but I learned about fulfillment. I learned about manufacturing. Um, and the other thing I did was I spent a year before I even started Proper Wild traveling around the country and meeting co-packers and ingredient manufacturers and flavor labs. I physically went into five co-packers and like interview them and learn about the production and the different machinery used and the hot fill manufacturing process and how all of that impacts my finished product. So I had a, like a ballpark understanding of the challenges. And I think that's really, really, really important. Um, you know, before you launch a new DTC brand, because there's so many little things that can trip you up. So, so let's talk about version one and, and Nick reminded me here, we are giving away lots of proper wild. So four attendees with the most questions will get a six pack of your choice. As I mentioned, I ordered the variety pack. It looks like uh, Christina in the chat it has some peach mango in front of her. So uh, your, your Love choice, that, Christina. <laughs> your choice, what you get. Um, with version one, did you outsource it? Were you brewing some of this in your kitchen? Like how'd you come up with like your <laughs> concoction? Yeah, so when I when we were selling proper my previous business, not Proper Wild, but FinTech Global Markets, um, I was I was drinking a lot of coffee. So I I was a um, I went to Michigan. Um, I had a bad neck injury when I was seventeen. Like I was on track to play college hockey. I was an athlete. Ended up my career ended up ending um, pre college, but I. Um, I was never big into like caffeine or stimulants or anything, but as I started getting a little bit older and understand them a little bit more and, and I'd like the taste of coffee, I started drinking a lot of coffee. And at the same time, I was starting to have some stomach issues. And there's a guy out in LA named Dave Asprey, Bulletproof Coffee, who's super, super smart. He's a biohacker. Um, and he, I, I was part of like a, a, a business group that he was involved with. So I would, I would periodically see him and he, he, he always be talking about Bulletproof. And, um, at that, at that point, we, um, I started to explore because I was having issues with coffee. I started to explore alternatives to, um, to coffee. And that really led me down this pathway of looking at, okay, what, what's out there? Pills and powders, other energy shots, nootropics. And <clears throat> it was at that point when I realized I don't really want to be taking pills. I don't really like the idea of these big caffeinated energy drinks. Um, I don't like the, the powders on the market. I really, I really like the shot format, tiny little shot. Um, and I, and there wasn't anything that fit what I wanted, um, in an energy shop product. So that, that was the catalyst to, okay, we need to, I need to look at this seriously. And before I then even moved towards actually starting a product, that's when I spent time meeting with flavor labs that actually develop, you know, these types of products, meeting with co-packers, understanding the creation process. We did a lot of, I did a lot of tinkering, um, both in my kitchen before we, you know, bottled anything, but also with flavor labs. The second, you know, one of the big challenges, the second you want to get rid of preservatives, you, you have to go to a hot fill pasteurization process, which then puts limitations on your bottle because when you're filling a bottle at 200 degrees, you, there's a lot of bottles you can't use. So you have to use a specially designed bottle. Um, and then it also basically removes all botanical stimulants from the market. So if you ever see a product on the market that has ginseng in it or rhodiola root or cordyceps mushrooms or anything that's botanical, um, it's not that it's snake oil, but whatever they're advertising isn't in the bottle. Because the second you hot fill something and have a pH below 4.4, below 5, none of that stuff has shelf life stability. So I went through, you know, learning about this and learning about the hot fill production process. And for me, like I had to make a list of what was the most important things for me, you know, zero grams of added sugar, 
um, no preservatives, label transparency. Um, it actually works, doesn't make me super jittery. I don't get a big crash. It tastes good. Um, if you have like a lot of those tastes is very difficult. So before, before I approached, um, you know, my future co-founders and we're, we have four co-founders, including myself, we basically, before we put together the team, incorporated the company, myself and my other co-founder spent a year just tinkering and, um, and learning and, um, figuring out if this was even a, you know, viable business. Um, and we do, you know, we also tested landing pages and ran Facebook ads and tested different brands. We're very data driven from a marketing perspective. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very difficult to launch a food product and reduce the risk. Um, because there's so many components as I've kind of just touched on that go into it. So, so a question here from Chris with the FDA, and they seem to be aggressive. You know, they forbid certain extracts and supplements. How did you? Yeah. How do you approach that? And has that affected your end product at any point where you had to like go back and start modifying the ingredients? Yeah. So, so most energy shots. If you look at Five Hour Energy or like most of these energy products, they'll have on the back label they'll say energy blend, and then they'll have like ten ingredients. And the reason they do that is if you make a, if you actually put on your label, like 180 milligrams of caffeine, 180 milligrams of L-theanine, which we do organic caffeine, L-theanine, you have to have that level of ingredient at every step of shelf stability. So if, if you're claiming 18 month shelf life or 12 month shelf life, if you test that product at that mark, you need to have that amount of ingredient. That's the thing the FDA cares about. Number one is label claims need to be accurate all the way out to shelf life. So most energy products will just put like some crazy energy blend. And one, what ends up happening is they'll just pack the thing with some, like there'll be 10 ingredients in it. They'll pack it with one ingredient that makes sure the label claim is always above, you know, whatever the energy blend is. And then everything else is burned off. So there's very little label transparency in most of the energy products on the market, which is a big issue for me. Like I really want to know what I'm putting into our body. So we, we did a lot of shelf life testing, a lot of tinkering on our formulation. We basically use the least amount of ingredients possible while having a really good functional benefit. Like our product works really well. We have a um, taste is another thing, you know, I think the product tastes really good. Um, a big segment, we have a very high repurchase rate, like a bunch of our customers like the taste, but some people don't. Like our, our, our product has a little bit of a green tea bitterness to it, which can come off as medicinal. That is just gonna be the reality of an energy shot. It's not gonna taste like a glass of fresh pressed juice. Um, but the number one most important thing was this baby has to taste, has to work really well. And let's use the least amount of ingredients possible. So that's really what we focus on. F, F, yeah, go ahead. No, no go, go for it. I was going to say F, FDA wise, like dietary supplements, it's not crazy. Um, the requirements around ingredients, there's, there's stuff like there's ingredients that they don't allow. But the reality is, is there's a lot of stuff on the market with very little science around it that is being stuffed into energy products and marketed as, you know, as this is the greatest thing since sliced bread for us. Um, we view, we view like energy blends and B12 and all this additional crap that is put into a lot of these energy drinks that doesn't have good science around it as short-term marketing wins and long-term failures. Because if the product doesn't work, like I think every great DTC brand starts off with a great product that hopefully can create a and not just DTC, but like every brand possible. The goal is to create that religious type customer, you know, Tesla, Apple, where people love your product and go around bragging about it. Not everyone's going to love it, but if you can create a product that, you know, your customer base, your addressable market loves, and then you build out from there, you can build out the brand, you can build out, you know, your marketing channels. But for us, it was like all about this thing has to actually work with the least amount of ingredients possible and we'll, you know, develop our marketing strategy around that. It wasn't vice versa, like putting in fake ingredients. I mean, it's crazy as I started to learn about the ingredient list 
and and um, the because pr production is a big piece of it as well. Um, a lot of these ingredients get burned off at production, and that's something a lot of people don't understand. Is is um, production when you're when you're you know when you're packing a million bottles, like it's it's harsh. Um, you need to use very stable ingredients, and then and then you talk about shelf life. You know, you're putting this thing on the shelf, or you're storing it in warehousing. It needs to be able to maintain its flavor, its functionality, um, you know, its taste profile. So there's a there's a lot of challenges there. So less is is gonna less is more um, for creating a great product. Um, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, it was great. So we got a bunch of questions here from the audience. The question I want to ask real quick before we dive into these is. So, you know, one of your, um, you know, one of your drinks is it's a replacement, I guess, caffeine wise or energy wise. How do you equate that? Is it like a shot of espresso? Is it a cup of coffee? Is it multiple? Like well, what should people expect? Yeah. So we use, we use, um, we make a label claim of 180 milligrams of organic caffeine. And um, just to be fully transparent, you know, cause we have a lot of industry people here, like we have to put more than 180 milligrams um, of caffeine in our shots, and that's so we're FDA compliant. Like no one, no one, no one in the industry when they say 180, like that typically means they'd have between, you know, 180 and 300 milligrams of caffeine, and that's so you just have to be conscious of that as a consumer that it's always more. Um, we're at 180 milligrams at shelf life and our most recent production run was is now 18 months shelf life so we've been able to whittle it out with real time shelf life stability um our our caffeine level is um about two cups of coffee okay for for us like we we chose caffeine because we're doing hot fill and the second you go to hot fill I can tell you right now the, the the botanicals that I mentioned earlier that have good science, like good science behind them, that they actually work and they're effective stimulant. Um, rhodiola root, um, cordyceps mushrooms, lion's mane, um, ginseng. None of these none of these botanicals can survive a low pH, sub five pH hot fill um, product. So when we manufacture our product, it's at 200 degrees. It's it's um, you know, it's at 200 degrees for 30, 40 minutes while it's being manufactured, while it's mixing, when it's going to filler, and then it's bottled at a low pH. So there's a lot of challenges around that. Caffeine is very stable, um, very stable. So I mean, I don't want to go too much into the secret sauce because there is some secret sauce there to our formulation. I saw some questions around like, aren't you worried about people copying you? Like. Like it's not really that hard to copy Coca-Cola. I think for sales and distribution and cash flow and like all of the sausage making to actually make a product work and then and then scale, I think is really difficult. There's a there's a reason why Five Hour Energy has been the industry leader for almost 20 years now, and no one's been able to knock them off, including Coca-Cola and Pepsi, who have taken runs at them. Like just having a lot of resources and being able to copy a product is often um, not the formula for success. And I think that that um, I'm not really worried about people, big companies in front of us. I'm more worried about someone behind us, you know, who's smart and intelligent, but we've, um, we're off, we're, I mean, we're off to the races. I don't think anyone's gonna catch us now. Like I was more worried about that a couple months ago, but we're growing so quickly now that I feel pretty good about where we're at. That's awesome. And let's get some into some of the fun stuff here. So I'm going to yeah. combine a couple questions. So from Chris and Maria. So how do you do taste tests? What demographics? And also talk us through like the flavor selection process as you continue to expand the product line. Yeah. So um, there's a artificial intelligence company here in New York called Gastrograph. And they work with um, they work with Pepsi, Coca Cola, Dohani. They work with big companies, and they've basically created. They have a team of two hundred professional taste testers, and they've created an what, algorithm. What, what's a professional taste tester? Oh, do, do their founders are from Cornell, and there's a there is a school of like, I, it's like I forget what it's called, but it's it's these people are they'll make half a million dollars a year as consultants for like Coca-Cola. 
literally yeah so they but what they've done is they've, they've created this proprietary formula where they basically have this this chart with 40 different things 40 different tastes that you can taste on your palate and it's a circle and 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 they they basically chart every product in america so like every main like coca-cola's charted and they work with a lot of these companies as well but they can look at the sales velocity of existing consumer products and then they can chart them and through data analysis they can basically say like the american palate likes these tastes you know the the, the chinese palate likes these tastes so like one of their projects was um dohani yogurt was launching in china and the taste profile was off and they needed to fix it for the chinese market the chinese market likes their yogurt a little bit more sour than the american market that likes it more sweet because we're you know we're fat here in the us um so these guys are really smart and that was one of the big that was one of the number one things i was most concerned about launching on on out of the mark out of the is i didn't want to have like founder feature creep in when it came to picking flavors and um, I didn't want to have three flavors that me and my three other co-founders and 10 people in the office thought were good. And then we launched a market and two of the flavors absolutely bombed. Did, did, so we you, were, did you launch any founder flavors that you ended up having to kill? Um, we didn't know because it was such a big concern for us that we, um, we worked with gastrograph and what they did was they, they took our raw ingredients without any flavors added and they taste tested them and mapped them on the chart. And then they, um, they ran it through their algorithm and their algorithm suggested a couple different, basically a couple different buckets. They said, you know, if you, if you pick from these 12 flavors, four, four, and four, you're going to cover 70%. You know, if you pick from these three buckets, you're going to cover 70% of America's taste preference. And what that did was it gave us options within different demos of the US, but it also gave us suggestions for the best flavors that would best mask the bitterness of our ingredients. So we took that data and we went to our flavor labs and we started working with them. Um, and you know, it's, it's a continuous exercise for, them, for us. The cool thing is this, this software actually makes recommendations on ingredients that you would never think about that could help mask bitterness or help, you know, increase the earthiness it's um it's really cool stuff and like and gastrograph is they're a venture funded company here in new york i mean what they're doing is is big time and there's no one else doing it on their level and i suspect they're they're i mean we worked with them about a year ago and we're continuing to we're going to start back up with them hopefully soon as we're launching more flavors but um i suspect they're just i mean they were killing it when we started with them and they're growing really quickly as, as you can tell it's important stuff so that's, that's yeah. awesome. I, I, I love yeah. it. I, we're, I love very, it. we're very, we're very data driven, like because me and my founders all come from tech software and in software, it's like really easy to put up a wall and then test it really quick and move it. And then CPG, it's not easy to do that, but we've, we've definitely brought a like very hardcore data driven approach to everything we do where we like to fail really quickly and inexpensively, but there's certain things like, you know, flavor, that there's always going to be a little bit of founder feature that creeps in, um, but you do your best to keep it as objective as possible. Glad to hear that algorithms are deciding what I like and yeah. more. So <laughs> and thanks. and two and two hundred professional taste testers. You should see these guys. It's incredible. Well, I remember this story oh. that blew up a while ago about the this guy who makes just an insane amount of money from like he's like the world renowned like water taste tester. So. Yeah. There's yeah. there's a job for everybody, I guess. Um, yeah. I want to get into you know some of the technical side of things in a minute, but a question from Drew to go back to something you mentioned earlier. So you mentioned a handful of um, metrics that you were looking at. Um, you know, it's not necessarily like a formula for success, but it's like w there were a handful of metrics that you looked at that you weren't necessarily thinking about before you launched. So like weight of the product. Uh, and other elements, would you mind just rattling off some of those again? I know that some people are trying to write them down. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think like um, everyone's formula is going to be a little bit different. But for us, like our target gross margin is 60%. Um, and that's across all of our, our channels. We want to be at a 60% gross margin. As 
as, as we, you know, get to maturity. And I think it's going to be really difficult to be at 60% um, through a DTC, any type of weight associated, like in a perfect, um, that has like no weight to it. And you're charging like, you know, I actually was looking at a company the other day, Nutrifol, which is a, a hair, I, I know someone there and he's taking me through some of their KPIs and it's like, you know, they sell a little tiny pill thing, a, a thing of pills, um, like a month supply costs $90 and it's like, it's like 10 ounces. So great, great margins on that. But I think the KPIs to look at when it comes to, you know, your gross margin is obviously fulfillment cost. That's a big one. And that's tied to the size of the product and the weight of the product. So the smaller you can get and the lighter weight you can get is going to reduce your fulfillment costs. Um, you know, working with ShipBob, we, um, you know, two warehouses versus three warehouses versus, um, you know, one warehouse can be as much as a 30 to 40% reduction in fulfillment costs. Um, we're currently, you know, working with you guys, two warehouses. If I go to three warehouses and as I increase my my um, you know our our shipping volumes, we're looking at probably like a twenty five percent reduction in fulfillment cost. That becomes substantial, so that's really important. Obviously, cost of goods is important. You know, you need to look at your cost of goods. Um, so when when we're looking at you know how do we get to that sixty percent gross margin, I'm looking at my cost of goods. I'm looking at you know my warehousing cost and freight cost. Um, and you know, with cost of goods, it's, it's material costs as well as production costs. I'm then looking at my fulfillment cost, um, all important. And, and then the big one now is customer acquisition because the days of inexpensive customer acquisition on Facebook and Instagram, you know, if you're a DTC brand, like five or six years ago, like th those were the, the heydays, it just doesn't exist anymore. Um, so now because customer acquisition has become so expensive and I can definitely get in. Uh, I'd like to get into like where I think you should be looking outside of Facebook and Instagram because I don't think Facebook and Instagram is the way in which you should be acquiring prospecting traffic if you're going to be profitable. But um, when you now now because because prospecting has become so expensive, you you really need to be thinking about your repurchase rate. Um, and you need to be doing email really well. You need to be doing SMS really well. You need to be doing rewards really well. Like you cannot succeed as a DTC brand unless you are viewing your marketing and acquisition strategy holistically 360 degrees. Like you need to be doing all of the, these things well to, to, break, to break even. Um, and if you don't have a great fucking product, like an absolute great product with a high repurchase rate, then you should just stop. Because I don't think you can be successful today there is there is so much money being flooded in now to Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat by big brands, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and, and, you know, gene companies that are doing it purely for awareness. And like, you know, they're blowing out end of month budgets and it's crushing, you know, startups trying to acquire customers cost effectively that if you don't have a great product with a high repurchase rate, where then you're scaling out your lifetime customer value, you don't have a shot to succeed. So for us, like our two North Star metrics that we're going after hard right now are our repurchase rate. You know, there's you have you have to start with a great product, but then reminding the customer about the product at the right cadence through SMS and email is really important. Um, retargeting on um, Facebook, you know, at the right cadence and Instagram is really important. Can all help your repurchase rate. And then also, um, our, we, we've created an internal KPI around our subscription rate. So what we're looking at is um, basically like 90% of our customers, if they're going to subscribe, they're going to subscribe in the first 60 days. So we are doing, you know, we are creating experiments and attacking those two KPIs. How do we increase our repurchase rate and how do we increase our subscription rate? And neither of those are going to improve if you don't have a great product. So you have to start with that, but then you can tactically do a lot of things to improve those. And you know, I mentioned email, rewards program, SMS, retargeting. There's a lot of strategies that can be deployed 
to increase your subscription rate, you know, through email, if you remind people, so, you know, we're driving a lot of traffic towards a, a landing page, six pack discounted offer. People are getting through those, those six packs, like in a 15 to 20 day range. Um, our conversion rate might be different. Um, you know, if we send an email and SMS, um, 20 days after versus 30 days after, you know, if you get them at the right time, it well, can with, improve your, go ahead. With, with subscription, I could not agree more with subscription. When did you start thinking about subscription as being, um, a must have within your product? And then when calculating ROI or payback, how yeah. do you include that from like your first purchase? Because you guys are offering free shipping. I've just got a bunch of questions on the acquisition side, but like yeah. you're offering free shipping, the, 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 the goods aren't that expensive. And so yeah. like, when do you expect the payback? Is it after 1.5 purchases? Like how, how do you guys do some of that math? Yeah. I mean, our, our, like, is this viable for the business is, um, is, is very complicated, is very complicated because we have different landing page offers with, we have an 18 pack offer that has a $50 AOV. Um, but the conversion rate on that is very different than the conversion rate on our six pack offer, which is a 20% off discount. Um, and it's a, you know, $20 AOV. The, the other thing I'll say is like where we're bringing traffic in from is also very different. Our customer acquisition on Facebook is very different than, you know, some of the stuff we're doing through SEM, um, where we have, we have third party review websites that, and, and some affiliate stuff we do. And so there's a, there's a big, I mean, every sales channel has its own unique funnel and it is, it, it, it it's not easy. Like I, I would say, like to be realistic and be just honest about where we're at our our strategy was launch this business knowing we're not going to be profitable the first six months like not even fucking close um customer acquisition is going to be way too expensive um our margins are not high enough on cost of goods and fulfillment we need to get to a lot more scale to lower our cost of goods we need to get to a lot more scale to lower our fulfillment costs um and we need to build out our holistic marketing funnel, which includes doing email really well and doing SMS really well and doing rewards really well and doing retargeting really well. Like it's gonna take a year for us to get the machine all rolling. And the thing is, is you can't do these things when you're not live. You mm -hmm. have to you have to launch them and build them as you go because they have to be experiment driven. You have to test and fail and improve and test and fail to get email right, to get SMS right to get your rewards program right, um, to get your website optimized, to build different landing pages. You can only do these things successfully on, on the fly. If you try to build them in a black box before you've launched, you got no shot, just no shot. You'll, you'll build a bunch of founder features and you'll, you'll crash and burn. And that's what I think a lot of CPG brands that are launched by big companies fail at. Like Coca-Cola has launched many of Energy Shot products and they'll spend like 25 or 50 million on the launch. And you know, if they don't, if they don't thread the needle, which they never fucking do, um, then it's literally like you should have just gone out back and had a big bonfire and had s'mores because it would have been a more productive event. Um, so yeah, like, so back, back to us, like we knew going into it, we weren't going to be profitable out of the gate. So our approach was let's use DTC to iterate on branding, to iterate on packaging, to, to build a customer base with a couple thousand customers across 50 states to test our assumptions, make sure we have product market fit, um, make sure we have people that are passionate about the product, um, learn a lot, and then start attacking everything I just mentioned um, and work towards becoming a profitable business all while keeping our burn very low. Um, you know, we're four very senior co-founders, didn't take salaries, we have one employee, I'm, you know, I'm in a WeWork right now in Soho with a 50%, you know, reduction in rent because I negotiated the hell out of WeWork. Like we're very, very lean. Um, and, and, you know, me and my co-founders, we have between the four of us, we have three exits um, under our belt. So like we, we could have nicer offices. We, we just closed 3 million. We had people that wanted to put in $3 million checks. You know, we could have raised 10 million with this most recent round with our growth. Um, we, we chose not to because we don't need more money. Um, we're like, we're going to continue to stay lean. I, I think it's sexy 
when founders brag about owning a huge piece of their business and not having raised any money. Like that's what gets me excited. <laughs> um, big teams and big fundraises, like I roll my eyes at that. I just think that that is like the least sexy thing in the world. I don't, I don't want to have um, a business that I own like, you know, 5% of that's worth a billion dollars that um, has like, you know, 400 employees. Like my dream would be to proper wild is, is doing you know, a couple hundred million in revenue or worth a couple billion dollars. And um, all the founders and employees own, you know, the majority of the business. We have a couple investors that helped us in the early days when we were starting to scale really quickly because we needed a little additional capital. We have a small team, like, and we're super lean. I, those are the businesses that um they get me really you know excited so nice um uh, yeah i i love that and, and let's go let's go ch channel by channel for a minute because you mentioned a lot or and maybe deep dive into a couple because yep. you listed off a lot of things that these companies you know some of these brands that are listening in today or are you know at your size or you know several times larger or maybe they're just getting started but you can't roll out. I think I've seen so many companies fail both in the tech space and in the e-commerce space from trying to do everything at once versus like finding that one channel that they can consistently grow over time, building on that while then bringing in either outside consultants or people internally or themselves starting to scale other channels. And so well, let's pull a couple examples. So like you've got, and, and you can pick and choose whichever one you want to dive into. So there's, I know you mentioned there's that like five word ad, which helped you guys lower CAC. I don't know which channels you guys are doing there. Um, you guys have grown really well. There's Facebook and Instagram. There's SEM. There's affiliates. There's SEO. There's SMS, which is also partly based off of all the top of funnel channels to get them into your database. Same thing yep. with email. You guys are in, I think, like 10,000 plus convenience stores or you know, really rolling out your like B2B side. Yeah, not not yet. We're just, a, we're just rolling in now. Um, through a distribution deal that we just closed. Yeah, so that's happening very soon. 12,000 C stores, yeah. Nice, well congrats on that. So yeah. that's a lot of channels, that's a lot of management, continuing to optimize each. So like, where did, if you had to like prioritize or stack rank and maybe the advice you'd give yourself from like when you were launching, like how would you prioritize yeah. and start rolling those out? Yeah, so I mean, 100% like do less like do less. Um, and we're, we're four co-founders. So we're, you know, we're small. The, I think the luxury we have is we're a very senior team. Um, we've, we've all built and sold companies and like can take on a lot and have a pretty high expertise across a lot of the marketing channels you've just done. Like we've gotten our hands dirty and have spent a lot of time on Facebook, and Instagram, have built out email um, drip programs, have done welcome series and, and fulfillment series. Like, um, but there's things that we didn't have a lot of experience with, like SMS, um, which we've now rolled out. And I'm going to definitely talk on that because SMS is, is um, I think, very important um, to do well moving forward. But so for, for me and our team, we looked at Facebook, Instagram as a massive, like a massive audience, massive channel that we could pop up and learn from really quickly, knowing it was going to be expensive. Um, going into it, knowing it was going to be expensive. We did, we did run some like early landing pages with fake ads and tested our branding and tested some customer acquisition. Um, but I think Facebook and Instagram is a great place to launch. There's a lot of Americans that spend a lot of time on there. So while it's expensive, it's easy to pop something up really quickly and learn about your brand and learn about messaging and communication that works well. So you can spend a lot of energy and time trying to figure out other traffic sources. And yes, they'll be less expensive like PR or doing, um, you know, SEM, we can get into that or, or, you know, doing SEO really well, getting a bunch of content created, but that's going to take a long time. There's going to be a lot of work involved in that. And it will probably, and it will, I mean, we're seeing it now. It's less expensive. Our customer acquisition is like one fifth in some of those channels that Facebook and Instagram is, but the luxury of Facebook and Instagram is you can move really quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think in the early days, you got to be willing to burn a little bit of cash to learn really quickly. So, I mean, our website, like we're on version 10. Um, 
And we, um, we used, you know, I mean, I think one of the smartest things you can do is install Hotjar and watch every person that comes to your website. So just watch what they do, watch their activity. Um, every founder should have, should spend like their whole Saturday on Hotjar and then their whole Sunday, like coming up with experiment ideas to talk with a team about on Monday um, of how we can improve our landing pages and how we can just like actually watching how people interact with your site. So for, for us, like when we launched on day one, we had one sales channel. It was our Shopify store with all of our prospecting traffic coming in from Facebook and um, Instagram. We didn't even have retargeting set up. It was just all prospecting. And it was like, yeah, we'll miss out on some sales, but you know what? Let's not put any fucking energy into retargeting because it's not going to make a difference. Let's, let's just put a hundred percent of our energy into figuring out creative um, audiences you know, our media buying strategy around audiences. And we, we were really aggressive there. Um, creative is really important. And then landing pages, let's optimize the hell out of our landing pages. And when we, when we were at like an acceptable level, which was still way too expensive. Um, but, but then, you know, our landing pages where it went from, you know, a 2% conversion to a 12% conversion as we iterated, it was like, okay, we're in a pretty good place now where we have good landing pages. When we bring in qualified traffic, we feel good about that. So let's now, you know, let's put a little bit of energy into retargeting. Well, so real, that, okay, real quick, if you don't mind me jumping in. So yep. before we even get to retargeting, still at the prospecting level, because like you're never done prospecting and driving those people top of funnel that have never heard about you before or have actually never yep. clicked on your ads. And so you mentioned some really important things. And I think it's helpful for everybody to like, um, try to simplify their views of, of these channels as much as possible. And so with Facebook, there's really a handful of levers. There's the creative, there's the copy, um, there's the offer, which it could be part of one of the others. Um, there's the audience, and then there's the landing page. Um, yeah. and, and even that's kind of complex. You could probably even simplify that a little bit more. So like, how'd you prioritize those? And again, I know that you had like some copy, I think tests that just created outsized returns, which was like your winner. So how did you like prioritize some of those or maybe what were some of the missteps? Yeah, I mean, you wanna, move, you wanna move quickly, but if you have too many variables, you can't measure what's working and not working. So we, we have a very big KPI dashboard, like every week. Um, so I, I also think if you're, if, if, you, if you're not this person, then this should be your first co-founder or your first employee, but a really awesome chief growth officer, chief revenue officer who, who is, um, you want someone who's a really strong data-driven marketer. You can, you can backfill your brand and CMO and all of that as you start to learn about, you know, who your initial customers are. But on day one, you have to be tracking your KPIs. And, and someone asked about, you know, our ROAS and, and CPC and KPIs. Like my, my simple answer to that is like, they're different across every landing page and offer that we have. We have customer acquisition costs that, you know, in the $150 all the way down to $10 in prospecting. And by the way, they all have like different AOVs and they all have different lifetime customer values and it's really complex. Um, but, but to your point, I think the key is, is not to have too many variables testing at once because then you don't know what's working, what's not working. So, um, Free shipping, it's been asked a couple times here. <laughs> like our cart abandonment went from like 90% to like 50% when Jeez. we introduced free shipping. Like it was that big of a deal for us. And and basically, I don't think you can be a food brand with with a lower price point unless you have free shipping. Because the consumer, the consumer is, and for us, the economics work. And I'm not saying that it's the right move for everyone else. But, um, and you can definitely use, you know, AOV, the size of the cart to hopefully incentivize free shipping, but it didn't work for us. We had a, we had like orders above $35. So it would force people into two six packs and our, the economics were like, you know, 10 X better for us by being free shipping. So, um, but like that was an example of you don't want to be testing that and a new landing page and new creative and too many things at once, because then what's going to work. 
or, or what is, you know, what's failing and what's succeeding. Well, real, real quick, is, yeah. On that too is like, I think sometimes people will over, overcomplicate things. Um, and I've definitely been at fault for this. Whereas like, what are some of the basics? And like, you know, Jeff Bezos and the Amazon team had a very interesting paper years ago that they were really betting the business on, which was like, there's really one variable that they saw consistent in like increasing lifetime value and like conversion rates. And that was free shipping. Yeah. Like, that's literally it. And that's what Prime has re result, revolved around, free shipping. And yeah, so you like, wanna, Casey, you wanna, you wanna make, um, you wanna make the customer think, well, this is no different than me grabbing it at the gas station or grabbing it at the grocery store. In their head, like you need to reduce the every 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 person that comes to your website can because they're they're interested. You know, they want to learn more. You know, they came in through a pro majority if they're coming in through a prospecting ad, like they're interested. So at that point, you need to remove barriers to get them over the the mountain. And free shipping is like you know is Mount Everest for the <laughs> consumer. And Bezos is also Amazon has trained everyone to expect that they deserve free shipping. <laughs> now. And these people don't give a fuck about your margins or does it work? That's your problem. Yep. You need to you need to go like, and I've done this. You need to go pick up the phone and call Ship Bob and tell him, you know, I need better pricing. I'm growing quickly. You need to battle your fulfillment company. You need to battle your co-packer. You need to battle um, everything along the way. Um, one one piece of advice though that I got very early on from um, Mark Dine who was my previous investor and one of my mentors and told me not to launch a CPG business. And he has a lot of CPG experience. He said, if you're going to do it, um, you need to have a 60% gross margin when you go into it because you're, and he said 60% gross margin after you give 25% to the distributor and 40% to the retailer. He said, you need to be at 60% after the distributor and retailer take their cut. He said, if you can't do that, don't launch the business. A big mistake I see with some of the companies that I'm mentoring right now in the New York City space is they have like a 50% gross margin before they've even like woken up to the idea that to put this across America, there's going to be distributors and retailers involved and they're going to need their piece. That, that, that's, and their great. Business, that's great advice. Yeah. And that's what Taylor Holiday yeah. mentioned, who he's bought and sold quite a few D2C brands is like yeah. just some basic stuff. Like, like for his, he wasn't doing the additional math that you were, but he's like, if, if we're not getting 75% margin day one, like I'm not going to really look at the deal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's like, and 75%, 80% margin day one is um, where you need to be before you are doing, you know, a distributor retailer deal. Um, so, so that's really important. And then the second thing, the second thing he told me is, um, is cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. You know, you like the, the as a founder, if you're not good at modeling and forecasting, um, then you need to find someone that is, or you need to work with, and it's typically not your accountant. You know, I'm, um, I have, I have an accountancy firm, you know, that does our bookkeeping and I'm lucky that that's like one of my skill sets is I am able to model out and forecast. And, and because that's like, that is, that that's a nail in the coffin for a lot of these companies. When, if you get lucky and, and we've definitely gotten, we've had some luck, you know, this dis distribution deal we just put in place. Um, you need to be ready to, you know, if you get called up to the big leagues from AAA, you need to be ready to enter that batter box. And if you don't have the cash to do it, um, you may never get another call up. Like with a lot of these distributors and retailers, you get one shot and you don't have to scale, you know, you don't have to be in every store across America, but like you need to be able to deliver. And I like, there's a lot of companies within my, my ecosystem and like network of founders now and investors invest in CPG. A lot of companies get past like the one to $5 million revenue mark and they make it into like the five to 20 and then they implode. Um, and I've heard a lot of those stories because they, they build their own manufacturing facility and they get caught in debt or, you know, their sales velocity is really good in their first, you know, two, three, four, five, ten thousand stores. And then as they go to 50,000 stores, the merchandising goes to shit um, and their sales velocity plummets. Um, or, you know, they don't have cash and they take on bad debt. And like, um, so those were the two pieces of advice. He's like, stay on top of your cash flow, understand the economics of the business, and then also 60% gross margins. So very important. That's great. And 
Gosh, I feel like we could just sit here and talk for hours. I want to be caught. Yeah, I, I love it. I love this shit. So I'm, <laughs> I'm good for a little bit longer if you guys want to go. But per yeah. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we can go a little bit over. Um, I, I So one thing I do want to call out that Nick, Nick put into his email, if you do scroll to the bottom, actually, so I have two more questions and then I'll ask my final question. We'll try to wrap it up in the next five minutes or okay. so. So if you scroll to the bottom of uh, Proper Wild, there's that little lion and he does his dance across the screen and we get some some little Easter eggs. So it's our Easter egg, yeah. Yeah, everybody click Proper Wild. <laughs> Before you go by, click click the little lion and check out the secret swag store. How did that yeah, what, come up? Like Yeah, what I would say is like if you're not if the business isn't going up to the right, don't fuck around with stuff like this. But 100%. like <laughs> th this is um but it but you also have to have fun. Like you have to have fun, you know, building your company. So this was a weekend project for me and one of my co-founders. Um, we're, we're also like lucky we got two full stack engineers in the team. So like, you know, popping something like this out is super inexpensive and cheap for us. We, um, we have like, we had a couple hundred customers that were asking us, hey, I love a t-shirt or, you know, we wanted, so we wanted to have some swag um, that we could sell to people and also just give away. And so we're like, you know, it'd be fun to have a little Easter egg in the footer. So. We we popped up actually. It's a separate it's a separate Shopify store, so it's not connected to our primary store. We wanted to keep it separate for a variety of reasons, you know, emails and there's just there's you actually think like launching new products in your store is simple, but that's where that's where it would have turned into a nightmare project mm -hmm. is emails and rewards and everything we're doing, you know, mixing the two. Do you, do you oh. use like a printful or something? How do you guys? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're, it's all on demand. Um, we're right. using Printful. Uh, we take zero inventory risk. Yeah. Someone puts in an order. We advertise. This is final sale, people. So if you pick the wrong thing, you're stuck with it. <laughs> um, we did relatively low risk. It's all like nice, you know, American apparel, sweatshirts, and t-shirts. Um, and it's, it's fun. And, and you know, we're, we're doing like, we're, we're, we're doing a couple of thousand bucks right now a month. Um, you know, friends and family and our loyal customers and our logo proper wild's pretty cool. Um, so it's it, for a lot of people like that don't care about the brand. It's still like a cool thing to have, you know, rocking around. We've sold a lot of hats. Nice. Um, yeah. So it's, it's fun. That, that's great. And I, I could not agree more with like, I mean, if you're not having some fun, like, yeah, we're, we're all trying to grow quickly and efficiently and there's competition coming from everywhere, but if you're not having fun while you're doing it, you know, what's, what's the point? And, yeah. Uh, and also don't mess around with, uh, you know, Easter eggs if the business isn't going up into the right. So that's, yeah, do something. not, do not waste your time on that. But yeah, it's, it's fun. And like, you know, we've already, we've already definitely already made back our money on the effort we put into it. So, you know, it's cool. Cool. So I guess actually we will have two more now and then one, cause somebody, people keep asking the, the five word ad. So tell us about the, the five word ad and, um, how you know just the impact of that um i i'm i actually don't know five word ad did so, i say something on that yeah you did so i think it was the energy shot for adults oh okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah cool 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 um so we i mean this is this is a bigger conversation but you go you launch you launch your product and you have all these assumptions on what language is going to work and what's not going to work and and both with landing pages you know looking at hot jars really important but also talking to your customers it's like reaching out to existing customers and offering them 20 dollars amazon gift cards if they'll do a 20 minute interview and actually showing them your landing page and then reaching out to random people that don't know about your brand and showing them a landing page is a great way to learn on top of you know the, the quantitative data that you're going to get um, qualitatively just interviewing people and be like, what do you see? You know, what do you think about this product? You learn a lot. Um, and then also with ads. So we've, we've probably interviewed close to a thousand customers of our existing customers. Um, and it's a lot of Amazon gift cards, a lot of free product. We, basically what we offer is we'll give you a free six pack or we'll give you a $20 Amazon gift card. Cause not, because a lot of people are like, fuck you. I hate the taste. I don't like the product or whatever. It didn't, you know, but a lot of people were like, oh, I want a free product. So you give them the option. And one of the big things that we kept coming back to was the thing I love about Proper Wild is, and this actually, we first heard this from a guy who is like 50 years old and he works at the Federal Reserve in DC. 
And he's like, I, I can't give his name, but he's like the direct, like he's way up there at, at the bank. He's like, I always felt embarrassed having like a five hour energy or a Red Bull or a monster. And it's not even something we would have thought. Like we created our brand and we made it gender neutral because basically that's where the data took us. Like we wanted something that resonated with both men and women. And we tested a couple different patterns. We tested a couple different bottles. Like we tested an all white bottle that was very clean and like Soylent-esque. Um, we went in the direction of our brand and logo and even name because it performed the best. But never in my, like, never in, in, in the scope of what I thought was gonna resonate with customers was it, you know, that this is more adult-like and I'm less embarrassed to have it on my desk. And that messaging has resonated really well with an older demo, you know, 35 to 60 demographic, which we've done very well with, which we also, you know, which we also probably like don't know as well. And, you know, you look at a lot of our ads, like I'm 32 and I'm the CEO, a lot of our ads have young people. So that's something to just think about as a, you know, I suspect a lot of the people on here are probably, you know, younger ish entrepreneurs. If you're not, I'm sorry, but um, you, you tend to like understand, you know, your background and your experience and your demo, but America's big and, and, you know, our product is definitely doing really well with, with people in our demo, but also older. So not ignoring that and being able to learn. So yeah, like the, the energy shot for adults um, was something that really resonated with an older demo and caught a lot of people's eyes and then creating creative specifically for those demos as well is really important. So that, I would just say like, yeah, yeah go ahead. No, no, keep, keep going. I would just say like, don't, don't, um, don't ignore, don't, don't make your customers who you want them to be. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, I think like a lot of businesses fail because the founders create a brand that they love and they go in the direction that they want to take it. And I mean, that's, that's why like we actually didn't do like a, a big um, branding brainstorm and like communication brainstorm early on. And, and I, I don't even like, I don't think a startup should touch a fucking branding agency until they're doing like, you know, 10 or $20 million a year in revenue. I just think you should iterate. You should be conscious of who, your communication and be consistent and, you know, but you should iterate into who you think you are. And then when you start to get some scale and you have a good customer base, I think it's appropriate to hire like a branding agency that can help you really, really like take your brand to the next level based on who your customers are. But in the early days, you got to figure out who your customers are and iterate and develop your brand based on who they are. So And I don't mean, outsource that. There's so many people I see that they're trying to like... Yeah cut cut in line and it's like no 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 you need to be on the customer calls and like you said saturday or whatever after after work like watching these like hot jar um replays because like it's, it's i do chris or casey i do 90 percent of our customer service still and i'll <laughs> be at like a date at 8 p.m at night at dinner and i'll be like i'm sorry I, i'm on my phone right now but i'm dealing <laughs> I'm dealing with someone, you know, and, and we use Gorgias and like, and I get excited about it. Um, but it's also, and, and like, I take, I take pride. I take fucking pride that it's like six 30 in the morning on a Saturday and a customer service message comes in on the chat and like, I'm responding. <laughs> um, I get it. Like it literally, I get excited about it, but it's also great because any, like I'm on top of, you know, do people like the taste? Do we have shipping problems? I'm really understanding the challenges to our business and what it's going to take to scale. I intimately understand who our customers are, what they want, what they like. So yeah, I'm a huge, huge supporter of being close to the customer. It's at the end of the day, like business is simple. You have someone across the table from you, you want to sell them something and you want to make money on it. So like everything should be about them. And then secondly, the second thing is, is make sure you can make money, <laughs> make sure you can make money on it. But like at a macro level, it's really that simple. And I think people fuck it up because they forget that it's all about the customer and then and then can they make money on it? They end up, I think in a lot of cases, they end up, you know, they care about the customer, but they care about their opinions more. And then the economics, they end up, you know, giving the customer a dollar and getting like 25 cents back. Um, and that's not going to work, obviously. Nice. And Unless, it, looks like, yeah. it looks like Barbie and Chris just both bought some. 
Nick's going to be buying some. Nice shout out to Gorgeous. They're they're a very close partner of ours over at ShipBob. You know, they're yeah. they're becoming synonymous with e-commerce customer support on the tech side. So definitely yeah. worth checking that out. Um, and and I, I just love the the example of like the energy shot for adults because I think about that as well. Like, you know, I can't remember the last time I had like a five hour energy. It was probably like right after college. And like, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, I probably shouldn't even say this, but like, when I see adults like grown ups drinking like a monster in a meeting, I'm like, what what are you doing? This isn't like, you know, sophomore yeah. in college. Yeah, um, for sure, so for sure. It, it's interesting that that's the gap. And so it's like the whole like Clayton Christensen's like job to be done. Like I know that there is a, a great example there where there was this like this like smoothie stand or like milkshake stand. And there was like one of the jobs to be done was these people would swing by, get the smoothie in the morning, then commute to work. And they wanted these, the customers wanted the smoothie to last them the whole drive to work. And so it was like, oh, let's make maybe slightly smaller straws or let's make the, the the smoothie slightly more dense so that it actually would like last them for the whole drive. And so it's like talking to the customers is stuff you wouldn't even expect, which is like, yeah. Hey, it's this older demographic, slightly older demographic. Like I'm not in my fifties, but like, I'm also not going to like roll into a meeting with like a five hour energy. Um, and so, uh, it's just, it's just those little things. So, all right, two more questions. One, you mentioned SMS and SMS is definitely a channel that I think some companies do extremely well. Some companies do extremely horribly. I'd say much more fall in the horribly camp. Um, because it's a new channel. And so, so five, five X, five X revenue per customer over email for us. So, so what do you, um, what do you, what do you guys use or who do you use? And then yes, please jump in. What are your top tips? Yeah. So, so, um, we do email really well. Um, we do about 20% of our revenue today via email. Um, we do not, we do not fucking blast people with email though. Like I, I think you need to have a good welcome series that should be you know six to seven emails long and have a lot of non offers just like reminding people educating on like you know your benefits your ingredients and then sprinkling an offer so you need to do welcome series well you need to do card abandonment well um post fulfillment i think there's some opportunities there you know where we sprinkle in some offers we do some subscription stuff some reward stuff so we're doing about 20 percent of our revenue via emails um, we do one campaign a month and one educational email a month outside of our post fulfillment series. And, and for us, like we actually get a lot of compliments from people that I love your emails because, you know, I hate when I'm getting hit every week over the head and it's all offer oriented. So like our offers, we go really big and we do one of them a month. And then outside of that, if, if it's not a piece of content that like I want to read and I think is really cool and educational, then it doesn't go out for our educational stuff. So I think that's really important. Email has become a big piece of our business. Um, we, use, we, we started using PostScript for SMS about two months ago. And for us, it was like, we, we, we were very hesitant because none of us had done SMS before. Um, we looked at a lot of the solutions out there. We definitely think it's more personal you know, I've I've done some SMS buying with um, Dirty Lemon. It's definitely a more personal approach. Our concern was is that the conversion rate would be way lower on capturing. Um, so PostScript is a great solution from just a technical platform and um, an integration standpoint, and also pricing. It's by far the best. Where it has huge failures is their SMS capture, I think is like, I'd give it like a C plus, and you can only have one SMS capture across your site. So mm -hmm. you can have one on every page, which doesn't work for us because we're using multiple landing pages. We have multiple different funnels. Um, so I think to make SMS work or, I mean, for everything, someone asked our rewards program, we use Yapo, but it's highly customized. Um, like we have a, a massive layer of customization on top of the traditional swell Yapo rewards. So if you go look at like um, a lot of the reward programs that, that use Yapo or now it used to be formerly swell, our reward programs like 10 times better because we've, we've, we've taken like what I think is a very mediocre solution, but probably still the best in the industry. And we've created a great consumer UI UX that sits on top of it. And we actually like they use they have a point system which I thought is so stupid. So we only show people dollars. We've simplified the hell out of it. We have like one reward screen where they had like all these widgets and it was it was a fucking terrible um, 
piece of software from a UI UX customer perspective. We completely customize it. So with Postscripts, we have custom pop-ups on every page um, that we built ourselves. So we do all the capturing ourselves and our conversion rate went from like one and a half percent using the Postscript pop-up and we're at like three and a half, four percent now. Nice. Um, so we have a little bit higher conversion rate than we had on email and we measure our revenue. We, so the way we compare email is on a revenue per customer basis. And through two and a half months, we're seeing a five X increase over email. That's so I, I think, I think the key with SMS though is not to be in people's faces, you know? So it's like, we will literally send one, maybe two SMS a month and that's it. But where it becomes really, really, really effective. And what we're seeing is stuff like our rewards program and post purchase and getting people in the subscription. So when someone has declared that they like the product and for us, that's, they bought twice. It's like, okay, we can be a little bit more aggressive. They've given us their phone number. Let's, um, let's remind them that they have points in their store credit, which before we had a, we had a ton of customers that had store credit and they weren't, um, they weren't utilizing it and they had bought like three, four or five times. And we're sending them emails, but it's getting lost in their email. So we start reminding them with SMS and we see our rewards program usage go through the roof. And if you do it in a very personal way, that's not badgering the person, but it's like, Hey, did you, did you realize you got $10 in store credit, $20 in store credit. Um, and a lot of our most loyal customers are building up pretty big store credits because we give $9 every hundred dollars you spend every $99. So I think that SMS can be a really personal, like effective way to communicate with your loyal customers as long as you don't abuse it. Um, and we're definitely seeing that. I think okay. where SMS is a huge failure is if you're using it aggressively for like, you know, your welcome series or post fulfillment. Um, and it's not people that have already committed to the brand, then you're, you're going to get knocked out and it's going to perform really poorly. Yeah. I've, I've been on the receiving end of both of those. And I'd say f fewer is better at least to start. And I know that's what the Postscript crew pr pushes as well, even though it's in their benefit for you to send a bunch. So my last question, uh, first, um, thank you to everybody for joining us. Again, this is the, the last uh, episode for this season. So thank you to so many people who have come back so many times. Um, I just really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Vincent, really appreciate you taking the time over an hour to spend with us today. Drop a lot of knowledge. I know I learned a lot. Um, we got a bunch of questions here and it looks like you uh, you got quite a few new customers as well. So spreading the good word. Um, thank you all. Uh, so usually I end this also by saying, hey, we'll be here just like every Wednesday, three o'clock next week. It looks like that's not going to happen. But again, thank you. And I'm going to end it with the question I always wrap it up with. So Vincent, what is your number one piece of advice for entrepreneurs today? Oh, man. Um, fail, 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 like and fail fast. But for, for all, whether you're, you know, a serial entrepreneur or a first time entrepreneur, like come to and I know this is cliche, like where failure is a badge of honor, but, but like create a culture in your company where failure is encouraged and accepted. And, and, um, and, and, and I think the key for that is if you're data driven and you're running lots of experiments, failure is okay. Um, you know, if someone, if someone is putting in a lot of effort and they're coming up with good ideas and you're making data driven decisions and you fail, that should be encouraged because when you when you move towards this culture of like it's okay to fail and failure is an opportunity to then change the experiment and move you know towards creating a solution towards fixing it i think that that is th the key to succeed um, you will if you have enough money you know and enough passion and you're smart and you're not a complete asshole like you follow the customer um, and you you kind of you implement that kind of attitude and that you know mentality that it's okay to fail. You're gonna you're gonna figure it out eventually. Um, so you know I know there's a lot of variables that go into success. Timing is important and capital is important and like there's a there's a lot of additional va variables. But if you have a mentality, you know it's okay to fail. I'm gonna fail my way into success. Um, I think you will be successful. And, and, you know, like people talk about how important timing is and there's been studies that timing is really important. I really look at, at like persistence and timing is all a function of if you fail enough times and keep at it and like keep iterating, you will eventually get lucky and time will be on your side and you'll be successful. 
And like, I've been involved with businesses that weren't going well, but I just grinded it out and, you know, we had a positive outcome and I've seen it often. Um, so I, I, you know, that, that's a big piece of our, of our culture is like, we're, we run cheap in experiment, cheap experiments on like, you know, weekly two weekly cadences. And we're, you know, no one ever gets told, you know, that was a stupid fucking idea or, um, failure is, is like a part of our culture and it's, it's, we don't reward it. I like, we don't have parties because, Hey, that fucking experiment <laughs> failed. But, um, but creating, you know, a culture where it's accepted and it's like, we're going to keep moving. That was a failure. Let's not make it again. Let's keep moving forward. I think is really important. That, that's a great call out. And, and a couple things I'll just add on there as we wrap it up is, is knowing what success and failure look like versus just trying something and saying it was a success or failure, but you need to like draw that line in the sand in advance. You yeah. need to be able to properly track that in advance. And then you need to like write that down or disseminate why it succeeded or why it failed across the org so that you don't make that mistake again or so that you do replicate that again. So Vincent, great way to wrap it up. Really appreciate you taking the time. Um, uh, and thank you to everybody else. So we'll wrap it up there. Uh, yeah, thank you, Wednesday. Casey. Thank you, um, thank you, Nick. Um, thanks for having me, guys. Big fan of Ship Bob as well. I didn't drop that in there. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to Nick <laughs> as always for being the mastermind behind this this whole program. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you, Nick. Nick, That's let right. me know. Thanks, everyone. For me moving forward, but thanks, guys. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Casey. Will do. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.